Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming. It, it's great to, to be in your presence and to be in the Lord's presence. And our prayer is that God would speak to you as we open his word. You can go to Matthew chapter three. Thanks, Doug, for reading that. Um, did you know that today marks the 50th anniversary that America was invaded? I don't know if you knew that or not, but America was invaded 50 years ago today, not by communists from Russia or China, but from four mop-topped boys from Liverpool, England. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. They stepped foot on American soil and their popularity just absolutely exploded. It's what we call the British invasion. And even before the Beatles played in front of 73 million Americans on the Ed Sullivan Show, when they sang their song, I Want to Hold Your Hand, that song had already leaked to the radio stations and it had become the number one best-selling song on Billboard. Um, but their appearance on Ed Sullivan was actually a historic moment. 73 million people watched these four crazy Brits who sang their song. And that's before, you know, there were seven TVs in every bedroom, before there was a thousand channels to watch. Who knows how many people actually watched the British invasion when the Beatles sang their song and the girls all cried and went crazy and the boys all tried to look cool and everybody started to wear their hair like those three guys. But really, when the, when, the, when the Beatles came onto the scene, they literally changed not only the music culture, but the absolute culture in America began to change. In an article regarding this, somebody wrote this. In February 1964, Anthony Ventre attended high school in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, where a mixed rat pack of greasers and preppies vied for the rungs on the social ladder. He was a greaser, he says, sporting a, a leather jacket, a duck tail, and the original brill cream in his hair. And this is what he writes. He says, everything seemed locked in a tidy, foreordained existence. And then came the Beatles. He says, I was sitting outside of Jack's Market in East Stroudsburg in a lime green 1953 Ford waiting for my father to return with the groceries when I Want to Hold Your Hand came on the radio. I started bopping around in my seat like a maniac and my father returned, saw me, and questioned my sanity. Later on when he saw and heard the music and the pure excitement of the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show, I could tell that even he was amused. And then he closes it this way. He says, suddenly, the 50s were laid to rest. Gone were the leather jackets, the ducktails, and the spit curls, whatever that is, <laughs> replaced by mop tops and a new type of hipness. Preppies were suddenly pushed to the back of the social bus as a new type of culture came on board. The Beatles came in with a bang, didn't they? Some of you are old enough to remember that. I will not question who that might be, but I'm sure some of you remember. The Beatles came along before I was born, but I became a huge Beatles fan. When I was younger, I would be singing Beatles songs in my bedroom, and I thought I was really good. You know, there's some people that make you sound good until you turn the music off and sing by yourself. But nonetheless, they were an amazing band and it's incredible to see what they did and how they affected culture. Their influence was absolutely incredible. And yet, as the time goes on, the Fab Four's influence is waning. Two out of the four Beatles are dead. John Lennon taken out by an assassin's bullet and George Harrison with a brain cancer. There's two left, Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney. And I think tonight they may be actually be doing a concert to commemorate their 50th anniversary. But as I think about the Beatles, I think they came in so strong and yet both Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are making their way slowly 
towards the grave. You look at them today and they're, no offense, they're old people. Now they're getting older. They don't look like the young 20-year-olds who showed up in America so many years ago. We've been talking about somebody who came on the scene. His name is Jesus Christ. He didn't come on with a bang. He came with a whisper, didn't he? He came quietly to an obscure place, to an obscure, obscure people, and yet this man who's been dead and raised again for 2,000 years, I would submit to you his influence continues to grow now, regardless of what you may see. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've walked with him not very long because somehow he came and interrupted your world. And how does that happen 2,000 years from when he actually walked this earth? But he did As the Beatles came and went, Jesus Christ came and he stays. And 2,000 years later, his, his impact on our culture is still being felt. Dr. James Allen wrote, and you probably have all read this or heard it several times, but it came from a book entitled The Real Jesus and Other Sermons. He writes this. He says, he was born in an obscure village, the son of a peasant woman, He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he became a wandering preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through a mockery of a trial. He was executed by the state. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 20 centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as this one solitary life. And this is the one we come to worship. And this is the one that someday uh, the Beatles, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, their, their, their voices will cry out whether they want to or not. Not a song about, I want to hold your hand. Maybe a song called, Help, I need somebody. Help, not just anybody. Maybe they will sing, I certainly absolutely believe this, they will sing the praise of Jesus Christ. In Philippians it says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is he's Lord today and we've been going through his life and we've been 13 weeks in this study and we've gotten to like his 12th birthday and we spent a lot of time looking at what he's going to be when it comes and and then John the Baptist and he's been an interesting study and today we finally get to where we begin to see his life kind of go before us the book of Matthew is written to the Jews. Mostly a Jewish audience would have read that. And so Matthew wrote, the theme of his whole book was that Jesus Christ is the king. In chapter one, you would see that there was an ancestry of the king. And in the next, we would have seen that there was an arrival of the king. And then the adoration of the king when the wise men came. And then the attestation of the king. The shepherds were shouting that the king is born. And recently, we've been looking at the announcer of the king in John the Baptist. But now, we finally get to get to the arrival of the king or the anointing of the king or even as I've entitled this message, the coronation of the king. So we'll start looking at his life and I am so excited. I don't know how long it'll take us but we are gonna go as long as it takes to go through this one perfect life. And so we come upon the scene where Jesus now enters into his public ministry in Matthew chapter three starting in verse 13. 
It says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But, but John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and, and, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And, the moment, and at that moment, the, the, the heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Oh man, there is so much inside of this and I, I don't wanna move too quickly. I want you to get all of this but we have to, um, we have to move sort of quickly and, and you gotta listen hard because some of this stuff is so important to know and I don't wanna move over it too fast but let's look first at the arrival of the son. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see the whole trinity inside of this. First, the arrival of the son. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan with the express purpose of being baptized. Now, that may not sound like anything to you, but to me and to John, it was shocking to think that Jesus would go to be baptized. I mean, why would Jesus need to be baptized? Especially when you understand what baptism we're talking about. John's baptism, like we said last week, was a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism for sinners. Now, let me explain this to you, okay, because it's different than the baptism that we do, and it's certainly different than the baptism that Jesus is about to do. I don't want to confuse you, but understand this. John was probably talking to mostly Jewish people, and his preaching was shocking that he would say to them, repent and be baptized because a Jew would never have been baptized. Oh, there was some you know, ceremonial washings that they would do, but it wasn't baptism. This baptism, or the only baptism that a Jew would have seen in that day was when a Gentile converted to Judaism. It was a proselyte baptism. And so the only people that would have been baptized in Judaism would have been non-Jews. They would have had to be circumcised, so much fun for the guys, and then they would have had to have this ceremonial cleansing, this baptism, and then they would have to keep the law. But it was only for non-Jews. So for John to preach this message, repent and be baptized, it was shocking to them. And what they were hearing him say was, act like a Gentile. Your Jewishness can't save you. In fact, you've probably gone so far away and what you need to do is stop, turn around, repent, and start looking towards the kingdom of God because it's here. And so many of the Jews were listening to his message and they were being baptized into this anticipation to see the Savior come. And that's why they were being baptized. They were repenting of their sins and they were being baptized. And so when, when Jesus shows up and stands before John, John's like, no, it's not gonna happen. Jesus, I am not baptizing you. You need to baptize me. When, when John saw Jesus, he saw two things. He saw, first of all, his own sinfulness. Because John was a prophet, okay? And John was a great man. In fact, Jesus said of John, didn't he, that there's never been anybody better than John. And yet John's response when he stands before Jesus is to look in the mirror and say, oh my goodness, I'm a sinner. And the second thing he saw was he saw who Jesus was. You know what that's called? It's called worship. It, it, what we do when we come here is not, it's not about us, it never is, it's all about him. And when we get a good view of who Jesus is, it does two things. It makes us see ourselves for who we are and it makes us see him for who he is and if you are rightly worshiping God, you, you, you get your eyes off of yourself and you start to see who he really is. 
The greatest man on earth says, I can't baptize you. I need to worship you because I know who I am. There were some African pastors who came to America and they visited a church kind of like ours and when they were done visiting, they spoke to the pastor and they said, you know, there are two things that we notice about you. Two problems really with the American church. He said, number one, They don't seem to have a theology. They don't know what they believe. They do things. They have programs and feelings and emotions, but they don't know what they believe. And secondly, he said, they don't know the meaning of worship. Do you know what the meaning of worship is? The meaning of worship is worth-ship. It's that he deserves it. I talked to a friend this week who um, is struggling and he's talked about the last several times that he's been to church that he got nothing out of it and he was so disappointed and I said, "Um, you're looking at it the wrong way. Church service isn't for you. It's not for you. Our whole reason for gathering together is to lift up the name of Jesus. It's to praise him. It's to worship him. It's all about him. And if you get anything out of it, that's gravy, baby. That's all extra. If you walk out the door and you feel some warm tingly, good for you. I mean, I hope it happens. But it's all about him. That's why we say, God, inhabit our praises. Sit enthroned on our praise because it's about you. And if you get anything out of it, that's gravy. And I hope you do. I hope God does move when you put him in his rightful place. But sometimes we don't. And worship isn't just a couple of hours on Sunday. It's a whole lifestyle. I think I read this a few weeks ago. Roland Hill was talking to a guy who said, you know, I'm moderately religious. To which Hill responded, well, then you are irreligious. For a man that is moderately honest is a rogue for certain. And so the man that is moderately religious is irreligious. If religion be worth anything, it is worth everything. If it be anything, it is everything. Religion cannot go halves with anything else. It must be all. We must, if we be thoroughly imbued with the spirit of Christ, imitate Christ in this, the giving up of all to God. We're saying, I own this. And John is looking at Jesus and immediately he goes to worship because those two things happen and something has to change in us when we see who Jesus really is. I had an awful conversation this week with a really good friend. And he stopped coming to church. And you know why? And he's wrong. (laughs) And I said, can I quote you? He said, absolutely. He said, I come to church and I see people who say they're all in, but I know they're not. Because I see them outside of the church and I know they're not. And I can't do it. He said, either I'm all in or I'm all out. And right now, he's all out. And I think he's missing it completely, but at the same time, my heart breaks because I think that's the biggest problem, isn't it? Brennan Manning said it really well when he said, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and they walk outside and they deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. It's true. If we really were worshiping God in a whole lifestyle approach, it would be seen in everything that we do. And this is who John was. But that doesn't really answer the question, does it? Why was Jesus baptized? I'm sorry, I kind of got off on that because I wanted you to see who John was and how excited he was to be proclaiming this message. And when he stands in front of the one that he's been proclaiming about, he's just so blown away by his glory. And when Jesus says, do this for me, he says, I can't because I need to be baptized by you. 
So why was Jesus baptized? Ever thought about that? Probably not. I have to admit, I hadn't really thought about it until I started to study it. Why was he baptized? Why would he do this? What was his whole purpose for existence? Why did he come? Can I tell you why? He came specifically to identify with sinners. He did what he did, I believe. You know how when we're baptized, what is it? It's a memorial for what we've done, right? I'm baptized because I, I, I became a believer. I followed him, and it's this picture of what Jesus did in my life. I was buried with him. I'm raised with him. What Jesus' baptism was is it was a foreshadowing to what was to come. When John buried him in the Jordan and brought him up, it was this picture of his death and his resurrection. It was this incredible object lesson for what was going to come. My whole purpose, he said, is to save sinners from their selves. This is why I came. And his whole life is about that, and I love that about him. And he's so scary because of that. Isaiah chapter 53 says this, he was numbered with the transgressors. What does that mean? It means if you lined them all up, Jesus would have been with them. He would have hung out with them, tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers and sinners. He was all there with them, and that's why the Pharisees were so mad at him. You hang out with these people, and they're gonna infect you. And his response, tell me something. Why is a doctor in business? Is it to take care of the healthy or the sick? It's to take care of the sick, and that's why I'm here. So he hangs out with these kind of people. He's there to reach them. I love what John MacArthur wrote. He said, I believe the supreme element in the baptism of Jesus was the identification of the sinless Son of God with sinners. And I think the first thing Jesus ever did when he stepped out of obscurity and he stepped into the limelight was to declare the very primary reason for which he came and that was to identify himself with sinners. He who had no sin took his place among those who had no righteousness. I love that. He who was without sin went down into baptism. That was, the only, that was only for sinners And he was saying as loud and as clear as he ever could say, I take my place with sinners. And let it be clear from the start that Jesus is the friend of sinners. Let it be clear that Paul was right. He who knew no sin became sin for us. His ministry began that way. How fitting. He didn't come just to teach. He didn't come to be a good example. He didn't come to be a moralist or a revolutionary. He came to identify with sinners and he was numbered with transgressors and it was their baptism that he was baptized with. In his death, he identified with sinners. In his life, he identified with sinners. His mother was a sinner. He died next to two sinners, and he lived all the time in between with sinners. That's what he did. That's what he was all about, and he would be there today. He would be in the AIDS wards. He would be in the places where there was awful things going on. That's who he was, and that's what he is all about. John 3.16 says this, for God so loved the world. 1 John 2.15 says, love not the world. Sounds contradictory, doesn't it? For God so loved the world, but don't love the world. I don't get it, do you? Actually, I do get it. Can I explain it to you? Here's the point. God so loved the people of the world and we are to hate the practice of the world. There's a big difference and here's what's happened in the American church. We love the practice of the world and we hate the people of the world. I'm just gonna allow that to sort of sit for a second because it's probably true. We're all about the American dream. 
But how many of us are about the Americans who are going to hell when they die? I don't know, it's something to think about, and I wanna finish this thought because I don't want you to lo- I don't wanna lose you on this, but um, here's a way to illustrate it, all right? And I think I've probably used this before because it's really the best way. It's a story about a pastor who, um, he lived in Brooklyn, New York, and he, 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 his church was really small, he couldn't make ends meet, and so he would take funerals for uh, anybody that would ask. And one day he got a call of a 25-year-old man who had died of AIDS, and he said, would you take this funeral? And he took it. And he was shocked when he, when he took the funeral. Um, he writes this, he says, about 25 homosexual men came and sat there. The whole time I spoke, their heads were down and they looked at the floor. Never once did they make eye contact with me during the funeral. We then went out and followed the hearse out to the cemetery, lowered the body into the grave. I stood on one side of the grave and they, they were on the other side, standing there like statues. I read some scripture and said some prayers, committed the body to the grave, and then said a benediction and started to walk away. But they didn't move. They just stood there. So I came back and I said, excuse me, um, is there anything else that I can do? And one of the guys said, yeah, um, I never go to church. Used to go to church, but I don't anymore. Uh, The only thing I really liked about church was when they read from the Bible, and you didn't read Psalm 23. I thought they always read Psalm 23 at the funeral. Could you read Psalm 23? So Jim opened up his Bible, and he read Psalm 23. And then another another man said, there's a passage in the Bible somewhere that says about God loving the world, and he said, that's John 3.16, and he read John 3.16. Then a third man said, what about the eighth chapter of Romans? I think right at the end, uh, it talks about something that keeps me going, and Jim read these words to homosexual men, neither height nor depth, neither principalities or powers, neither things present nor things to come. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, nothing. The writer says, when he told me this, I hurt. I hurt because I knew that these men wanted to hear the Bible, but they would never step foot inside of a church because they are convinced that the church people despise them. And do you know why they think the church people despise them? Because the church people despise them. Because we hate the world that we're called to love And we love the world that we're called to hate. And there's a problem with that. Now hear me properly, okay? Because I don't want you to quote me wrongly. Hear the whole thing. You understand where I stand on gay marriage and fornication. Anything that's in the Bible, I believe it absolutely. And I'll call it what it is. And we should. And we will. In fact, the elders have been getting together and we've put things in our constitution to prepare for the day when somebody comes and says, will you marry two men or two women? So that we can prepare legally to say, no, it's not gonna happen because we believe this. But that's not the point right now. The point is this, and here's my philosophy of ministry. This is what I want us to be, okay? When anybody comes through these doors, I don't care who they are, I don't care what they're practicing, I don't care what they're doing in their private life or their public life. Anybody is welcome here, anybody is welcome here. And my prayer for you and for us is that anybody that comes through, they will sense in us this incredible love and empathy and care and non-judgmentalism, if you will, that when they come in, they know that they are cared for. And then they'll come in here and they'll sit in these chairs and they will feel very uncomfortable in their sin. That's what I want. And this is what I want to see happen. I want to see them have to deal with that. That they can't blame it on the church. The church is so unloving. They'll say the church is so loving but their message is so hard. Yes, it is. It is so hard. It's an impossible message. And what we've done is we've looked at people and we've judged them instead of looking at them and going, if they only knew. Some of you are so judgmental in the the fact that you think you're better than other people and people get it. 
We're not, none of us, none of us should be here. We should all be like John going, I don't even deserve to unclasp the sandals that you wear. I don't deserve to, to, to carry them for you. I'm the lowest of the low servants. I don't deserve it. That's who we ought to be. And it doesn't matter what anybody else's deal is. If I were to put up on the screen any one of your thought life this week, and it were in vivid color, everything that you thought about this week, you would be mortified, right? Oh, look, nobody's gonna agree with me, but it's true, isn't it? It's true, because we're still messed up. Even though we know Christ, we're still not there yet. We are, we are positionally perfect, but we are practically in process. And my goal is to see people know that we're not perfect, but we preach about a perfect Jesus. And the reason Jesus was baptized was to identify with these people because he loves these people. And that's our desire. Does that make sense? Do you get it? That's what we ought to be. This is who we are. So that's the arrival of the son. Let's move on, shall we? Of course we shall. Let's look at the anointing of the Spirit. This is so cool. It gets better, believe it or not. Well, I don't know if it gets better, but it gets, it's good. The whole thing. It says at that moment. So, so here's the picture. John then baptizes Jesus. That whole symbolism. Death, burial, resurrection. That's gonna happen someday. That's what he's gonna do for us someday. And at that moment, get the picture. Heaven opens and the spirit descends on to Jesus like a dove. What an incredible picture. You know, we don't see that very often. And even in scripture, you know, Ezekiel saw the heavens open. It was a wheel within a wheel, and it was weird, and nobody gets it. You still read Ezekiel today and go, what was that guy talking about? What did he see? You see Stephen, right before he dies from being stoned to death, the sky opens, and Jesus is standing there and welcoming him in. Paul was taken to the third heaven. He doesn't really explain it because he said, I saw things that I can't even tell you about. In Revelation, we see heaven open a couple times and the picture is amazing but unexplainable. John writes Revelation with words like, it was like this, it was like that. How do you explain something you've never seen? How do you put it into words? And when Jesus comes out of the water, the heavens are open, it cracks open and, and, and there's the Father and here comes the spirit descending like a dove. Have you ever thought about that? Why a dove? Why, why, why not, you know, something else? You know, why not a butterfly or, uh, I don't know, some other animal? Why is it a dove? God doesn't make mistakes. There's, there's a reason for it. When a Jewish person sees a dove, what do they think immediately? Sacrifice. In the Jewish system, you could sacrifice uh, an ox, you could sacrifice uh, a, 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 a lamb, you could sacrifice a dove. But the first two were for rich and upwardly mobile. The dove was for the poorest of the poor. Anybody could sacrifice a dove. And so when the Spirit was descending on Jesus, it's this picture that he is this sacrificial dove, that he's come to sacrifice himself. And later on, John says this when he sees Jesus walking. He says, look, I think it's even gonna come up on your screen. It says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Why a dove and why a lamb? There's a purpose behind both of those because who is he? He came to sacrifice himself and the spirit descends on him like a dove and John calls him a lamb. If you read in Revelation, you hear them talking about Jesus. It says, and there was the lamb of God and it pictures him as if he had been slain because he had. John preached a sacrificial savior. John preached a sin-bearing savior and John preached a sin-atoning savior. It meant the whole world was gonna benefit from Jesus coming. It's the grace of God, and isn't it amazing that God sent his son to die for you in your place? Amen, Todd. That's right, brother. You preach it, son. <laughs> but I want to explain grace properly, okay? Grace properly understood is not you get heaven for free, 
No problem, just accept Jesus, which by the way is nowhere in the Bible. It's not there, but I want you to understand what grace cost. Remember, at the end of summer, I told this story, and I want to tell it again because it's the best to illustrate what real grace is. There was a pastor and his family, and they were going down to Texas to a family camp. Some of you will remember this story. And as they're going, there's six kids in a suburban. And you already know what's going on there, don't you? They're too close to one another, and the longer they go, the harder it gets, and one starts touching the other, and it all falls apart, and they're like, he's touching me, he's touching me, he's in my space, and, and the, the dad turns to them and says, stop fighting, but they wouldn't stop fighting, and so finally, he threatens them with the worst possible punishment. He turned to them, and he said, if you don't stop, none of you will play Mission Impossible when we get to camp. And you could hear the breath leave the whole vehicle because the whole reason they went to camp was to go to Mission Impossible. It was this great game. When they got there, they went to chapel and then they had their family meeting and they would get all dressed up in black and they would go out afterwards and they would hunt down these glow sticks and it was some great game that they all loved. And he threatened them. And he said, if you don't be quiet and if you don't stop touching each other, no Mission Impossible for you. So you know what happened? They were silent for five minutes. (laughs) And then it happened. One touched the other, touched the other, and it went all over again. So dad turns around and says, no mission impossible for you. 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 And no mission impossible for you. Five out of the six kids were detained when they got back and told they would go back to their cabins after chapel. The oldest daughter, the responsible one, was the only one that didn't do wrong. And so that night at chapel, they go to chapel and the guy that's preaching, he's talking about the grace of God. God's game plan for life and it is grace. And after that, they broke into their small group and the dad said, so what is God's game plan for our life? And one of the smart ones said, Dad, God's game plan for life is grace. And don't you think this would be a time to exhibit that to your children who have sinned against you, but can't you just let it go? And the dad said, it's done. You got it. I will show you grace And then one of them even quoted a scripture that said, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. And the dad said, amen. But he said, keep reading. He said, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So here's how it's gonna go, kids. You five, you can go, but only if your sister can't. She was the only one that lived up to my perfect standard. And the only way for you losers to go is to admit that she's perfect. And when you go play, she will be banished to the cabin. And his daughter looked at him and said, "Uh, Dad, is there any other way? (laughs) And he said, there is no other way. And he said, would you trust me in this? And she said, I will trust you in this. And he said, before you go, though, I want you to look at your sister, and I want you to admit that you don't deserve to go, but the only reason that you're going is because of what she did for you. And they all said, okay. And they all went and played whatever that game is, and she went back to her cabin. She got in her cabin, and there was a knock at her door, and it was her dad. And her dad said, hey, come with me. Those guys can go play their stupid game. We're going to the store. And here's the answer for any question that you ask tonight, honey. Yes, whatever you want. So they went to the grocery store and she bought all these snacks, you know, popsicles and ice cream and ho-hos and ding-dongs and Twinkies and all this stuff, loaded up $89 worth of junk food, brought it back to her cabin, the spoils of her sacrifice. And you know what she did when her brothers came back and her sisters came back? She shared the spoils with them. And the next day, guess how they treated her? Wonderfully. 
And the next day, guess how they treated her? Horribly. <laughs> they forgot so quickly what this grace was all about. But this, to me, is one of the greatest pictures of what grace is. It's not just that you get to go to heaven on somebody else's ticket. It's that somebody died so that you could go to heaven. That's the thing. And that's why we worship, because it's an amazing thought. And so when the, when the dove came and when he p- spoke that this was going to be the Lamb of God, they got that picture. But the dove represented the Holy Spirit of God because Jesus came as a man. The Bible says he emptied himself, right? He, 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 he did, got rid of some of his godness, if you will. I don't know how a better way to say it. He became a man. And so he would be tired. He would get weary. He would get hungry. He would be tempted. He would be sad. He would be all of the things that are human. And what he needed was the spirit of God in him to do what he had to do. And so God gave him the spirit to do those things. Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. This is to Jesus. He came and the spirit of God came upon him. And there's that picture. But the final thought is the announcement of the father. And this is so good. This is so awesome. This is my beloved son whom I love. Him I am well pleased with. It's looking forward, really. But here's the thing, all right? Get the whole idea of the dove and the lamb. When the Jewish people would take a sacrifice to the temple, you know what they would have to do with that sacrifice? Before they sacrificed it, it would have to be inspected. And the sacrifice had to be perfect. And if it wasn't, they had to get another one. And so what God the Father is doing by this pronunciation is look at my son, the perfect dove, the perfect lamb. He's spotless in every way. This one who identifies with sinners, this one who is the dove of sacrifice, I say to you, I am pleased with him. I accept his sacrifice. God says I've examined him and he's perfect. This is so amazing. It's a great word that I love to use. Are you ready for it? Maybe you can help me out. This theological word, it's called propitiation. Beautiful. I sound so intelligent when I say this word, but all it means is satisfaction, that God is satisfied with what Jesus has done. And he announces it before Jesus does anything because he knew that he would come through. What an incredible story. What an incredible savior we have. And we get to look at his life. We haven't even started yet. This is gonna be fun, I can't wait. But here's the last thought, okay? And then we're gonna go into communion and probably a perfect time to go into communion is when John said those words, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Do you know what he said after that? After that, he was talking to two of his own disciples and he said to those two, go follow him. Go follow him. What I am saying to you is go follow him. Make this thing real. Own it, guys. It's true. It's what he's done for you, so own it. Bonhoeffer said, when God calls a man, he calls a man to come and die to himself. We don't take Jesus on and put him on like a shirt we, we, we are baptized into him and he gets inside of us and he ought to change every part of us. Own this. Think about this. The Beatles are gonna be dead in 10, 20 years. You will stand before Christ someday. Make it your life's goal to serve him. I'll close with this. I heard this from Ravi Zacharias, but I think it's so good. And, and one of my, I've read through um, uh, 
David Livingston's biography. What an incredible man he was. In, in 1813, he sat on his daddy's leg, knee and he, he listened about from missionary stories. And, and when he was just a young boy, he, he gave himself to serve the Lord in missions. And um, when he arrived in Africa to, 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 to give his life to this, he wrote this in his journal. He said, the haunting specter of the smoke of a thousand villages has burned itself within my heart. Then he got on his knees and he wrote these words, send me anywhere, only go with me. Lay any burden on me, only sustain me. Sever any ties, but the ties that bind me to your service and to your heart. He said as he, as he, as he wrote these words, the words of Christ came to him saying, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And if you, if you read the story of David Livingston, he, he gave his life, he, his wife died, a couple of children died in service. He, he lost his eye, he was attacked by a lion, so he basically lost his shoulder and the use of one of his arms. When he came back to England on a visit, the people were shocked at how he looked because he was kind of a fair-skinned guy and his, his skin was just baked. He, he'd lost so much weight, he'd given himself so to that that the people were shocked, yet kings and parliament wanted to speak to this man. And he went back because he couldn't stay there. There was something that was driving him back. The specter of a thousand villages were still in his mind. And when he went there, his wife stayed behind for five years. She finally came back to the village and on the day that she arrived back in Africa, she caught what was going to kill her and she died a few weeks later. David Livingston gave his life to those in Africa and there was a time and and, and I know we get older and we forget about what happened in Livingston's life. He's kind of like the Beatles. People have forgotten about him. But um, he had lost some medication and he needed this medication and he went back to his, his, his hut and, and a man came into his, into his hut and he'd been praying, God, you know I need this medicine, you know I need this medicine. And he turned and there was a man, a white man, the first white man he'd seen in Africa in forever. His name was Henry M. Stanley and remember that famous word, that famous phrase, uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. I don't know, some of you are older, maybe you get it, I don't know. But it was this point these two met and, and, and Livingston greeted him and, 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 and Stanley said this to him. He said, let me tell you two things about me. He said, first of all, I am the biggest swaggering atheist on the face of the earth. Please don't try to convert me. I'm here from the newspaper in America and they've sent me to do a story on your life. And number two, Somebody has given me some medicine to give to you and it was the medicine that he wanted. Four months later, this big swaggering atheist put his faith in Jesus Christ to save him and served with Livingston some more time. David Livingston became so weak in serving Christ in Africa that he had two Africans that carried him from village to village wherever he went. Finally, he was so weak, they brought him back to his village, they brought him into his bed, they were gonna lay him in his bed, but he said, no, I want to pray. So they put him next to his bed and he began to pray. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and it was so uncomfortable, those guys were like, he needs to get into bed. And so finally, they went into his room, and they found David Livingston dead in the position of prayer. And they took Livingston and they buried him, or they, did, they, they took uh, I think it was Stanley that took a knife and cut his heart out and buried it in Africa. And he took his body back to England because his whole life was about serving the African people in the name of Christ. Because the message of Christ meant something to him. Do you know what I'm saying? If it means something to us, then it should affect us every day. It affected John the Baptist. He gave his life for it. It ought to do the same for us. As we go into communion and Bernie leads us in that, I want you to begin to think about what Jesus did for you. Let me pray for you. Bernie, you can come on up. Lord, I thank you for this subtle little story in your word that it just, it, you, can just get, you, can, you can just pass over it so fast and it's loaded 
Thank you, Jesus, that you submitted to the Father's will, that you, you submitted to baptism, even in this picture of your death and burial and resurrection. And I thank you for what you did after your baptism. Lord, I pray that it would affect us every day in everything that we do. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.